So as we become more dependent on satellites and technology and stuff like that, is it going to become a bigger issue and more important to definitely know what's going on with these uh, potential storms? Oh, it's essential. It's absolutely critical. Uh, and it's not just the satellite industry. The power grid needs to know these things, too. And I'm sure we'll talk in more detail about that and what it means for them. But for satellites in space, let's just think about this. The storms in May was tremendous. It was uh, G5 level storms, G4, G5 levels for 24 hours. And when you include G3, it was a 36 hour storm. And that storm led to the largest satellite migration in history. 5,000 satellites were getting their orbits raised to combat the changes that were going on in the outer atmosphere, what we call the ionosphere, for low Earth orbiting satellites, they would have burned up in the atmosphere. It was the largest satellite migration up to that point, but the storm we had in October, even though it didn't last as long, became the newest largest satellite migration in history. And this is what we're going to hear about as we continue to send satellites that we rely upon so much out there. Now, other storms like radiation storms, they affect satellites that are those geosynchronous, those outermost or orbits from Earth, uh, geostationary satellites, because they get pelted by those particles. And when they hit them in just the right way into the instrumentation, it can send an anomalous command, which can lead to inability to get the satellite to work properly. And in the worst case scenario, it's just not going to function anymore. And it's become floating space junk. So that's why we communicate with the satellite industry as much as possible to help protect those critical assets, because whether we realize it or not, we're all reliant upon satellites in space in today's world. So we, we talk about this as kind of a recent thing, but the most famous geomagnetic storm was the Carrington event back in the 1850s. If a storm that strong happened now, what kind of impacts would you expect us to see? Well, Brad, that is the benchmark storm. That is what our government in this country and other countries around the world are planning for and working towards to be ready, to be resilient, to be able to mitigate that kind of storm. But what happened in 1859 was an astronomer named Richard Carrington was observing the sun. He was drawing a giant sunspot group, and he noticed two white lights form around the sunspot group. Now, he wasn't looking with a fancy telescope like we use today in different wavelengths of light. He's looking at visible white light. What he saw was a tiny area around those sunspot groups become brighter than the surface of the sun. That's unbelievable. It's a very rare event. He didn't know at the time, but what we call that today is a white light flare. And he put it on his drawing. 18 hours later, the sky lit up with aurora very, very far south or very far north if you were in the southern hemisphere. And the world saw the aurora at that time. Now, the technology we had of the day was telegraph lines. That was our main technology. So you had telegraph operators slapping their metal plates together, sending a signal across copper wire stretched between states or territories, and batteries were sparking. 18 hours later, batteries were sparking, the stations were starting on fire. There's even a documented conversation between two of what I call ditty boppers, these telegraph operators, and they decided to disconnect their batteries. Remember, we didn't have alternating current at the time. It was all direct current, so batteries. They disconnected the battery. They could still send a signal across the line with no power hooked up because of the natural currents that were flowing on those lines allowed a signal to be carried. That's what we're concerned about today because what we think would happen today if we had that level of activity happen is that the power grid would be extremely stressed. We're a highly interconnected system just in North America alone. And the high voltage transmission lines will get these currents developing on them. And the stronger that amount of volts show up that don't belong there, that can overheat transformers and damage them so significantly that they will be inoperable. That is the concern. We don't know if that would happen today or not, but we know we're not resilient enough at this point to say that it can't happen, which is why we do what we do. To warn the power grid, well in advance of these storms so they can prepare just as they did the storms in May. So you, you mentioned something about the power grid. Is that the main thing on ground that we really worry about? I mean, I know GPS from satellites can get messed up, but is it those p potential impacts from uh, uh, the, the electric power grid that would cause us the biggest issues on the ground? Correct. The biggest ground-based concern is really about those what we call geomagnetically induced currents, the geomagnetic disturbance caused problems on the grid. As you mentioned, GPS accuracy for ground users can be wiped out and totally useless for many, just as happened with the storms in May as well, when many, many farmers across the country were trying to plant seeds and their precision guided tractors, which so many use today, they're very precise, accurate within centimeters. They were off by 12 feet. There's already a study being done by a professor who is uh, already estimated, and he thinks this is on the low end, he knows this number is gonna go higher, 
This was a $500 million impact to the agriculture industry as a whole because of the setbacks this caused and delayed uh, due to the ability to use their equipment properly. Aviation couldn't use their GPS systems across the United States for 15 hours because of the extensiveness of that storm. But the power grid is really what our government has its most concern about, right? Because let's think about it. If we had a collapse of the power grid because of a geomagnetic storm, we're not talking about somebody's just their house. We're not talking about just a city block or a city or even just a state. We're talking about several states going without power due to a significant collapse of the grid that's so interconnected. And that would lead to billions of dollars of loss because this wouldn't be just for a few hours. This would likely be for days, especially if the transformers were damaged. It could lead to weeks. That's what we want to be prepared for. That's what we want to be ready for. That's what we don't want to see happen, which is why the federal government for the last almost 20 years now has been invested in continuing to understand more about space weather, be prepared for it, and enhance our ability to do space weather for forecasting and preparedness.